about because I'm going to help try and navigate through this question uh, with Sam Lewis, freelance journalist and political commentator. Sam, hello. Thanks for joining me. Evening, Nick. Thanks for having me on. Well, it's a pleasure and, and, and giving up some of your Sunday evening to do this. On the face of it, Sam, this is slightly annoying, really, isn't it? Here we are. We've got lots of people, lots of jobs being advertised, record number of jobs um, and one and a half million unemployed and actually quite a few economically inactive, but not necessarily drawing benefits. Why, why can't the two meet and solve all our problems? Well, I think to understand, you know, the problem of unemployment at the moment, we have to take a step back, actually, and look at, you know, three different types of unemployment that there are. And I think that, you know, the first type of unemployment is cyclical unemployment. And, uh, you know, this has followed boom and bust cycles. So, for example, last year, um, when, you know, the pandemic started, um, you know, the economy contracted by 9.9% in mm. 2020. Um, and yet, because of the furlough scheme, there wasn't, um, as high in unemployment as we saw in the 1930s as a result of the Depression when it got up to 22%. Um, so the Chancellor intervened and, you know, we didn't have the unemployment that followed. Uh, the second form of unemployment is frictional unemployment. Um, and when you look at it in terms of a lot of people during the pandemic decided that they didn't want to go back to their old jobs and they yeah. decided they want to pursue their dreams and do something else and start their own enterprise or do whatever and they still count in this uh, unemployment statistic. So you could say in that case, the unemployment stats at the moment are a bit uh, overhyped. And finally, you have structural employment, and this is potentially um, the biggest issue here, which that comes from technological change within the economy. You know, when the car first came along, a lot of horse riders, a lot of horse carriages and horses, for that matter, lost their jobs. When the DVD came along, VHS manufacturers lost their jobs. Now we're seeing, you know, the, the move from the work office, from the workplace to working from home. Technological developments have changed in the last two years that mean people are working from home and want to work from home. So they might be, um, you know, not necessarily wanting to go back to the old jobs. Maybe, unfortunately, not enough baristas want to, to work in coffee shops near you, Nick. That's the issue. But um, part of the issue within structural unemployment and part of the reason there's unemployment now is the mismatch between the skills that people have and the skills that the economy wants. And this is the biggest issue that needs to be addressed. So, so what, is, what is that precisely? Because I thought you were going to say, and this shows why I'm not an economist, I thought you were going to say, actually, um, people who've gone through furlough now have taken a look around and decided they're working for such low wages in the barista places and, 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 and elsewhere that actually they're doing a complete re-evaluation. Um, but you're not saying that, are you? You're actually saying the demand, uh, the, 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 the jobs that are there we don't have the skills for at all and if that's the case doesn't this point to quite a substantive period of shortages of labor in our country well it's, it's a much bigger issue i mean there was a bloomberg article last year which suggested that over 90 percent of uk workers lack the skills needed in the 2030s to well to function in jobs that's according to analysis by mckinsey and i mean the current skill shortage that we're seeing of course hgv drivers were you know big a few weeks ago and we had uh, the fuel crisis, you know, that used to be filled by immigration, but this isn't filled anymore by that. And it is a worry, but, you know, when the Chancellor announced the budget um, last week, he said that the government will raise government spending on skills and training by $3.8 billion over the course of the Parliament, which is an increase of 42%. So, obviously, Whitehall understands that this is an issue. But that doesn't solve it in the short term. That these are structural issues that may take a bit longer to solve. But are these when you, when we talk about upskilling and the training needed? Are we talking about something that can be done in three or four months? Maybe I don't know how long it takes to train, for example, an HGV driver, but I suspect it's not years. Or are we talking about the the, the new economic, um, uh, 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 if you like, trendsetters, the businesses, the higher tech skills businesses? Are we talking about years of training? It's a bit of both. This is, you know, analysis recently has sort of suggested that it's economy-wide. It's not just within sector-specific, um, but, you know, this, uh, the HGV drivers, for example, have made the headlines because it was such an impact on, on the fuel crisis. But this is where we've, we've you know, got uh, graduates from 2020 coming out of university and from 2021 mm -hmm. all applying for the same jobs and youth unemployment, you know, 16 to 24-year-olds. Um, you know, currently youth unemployment is about 13% compared to the pre-pandemic level of about 11%. And, you know, they've been most hit by this. And you'd hope that they would uh, upskill and they, they'd be given up access to these opportunities. But, of course, you know, a lot of our universities 
um, are humanities graduates and they don't necessarily have these skills that you know we do need to invest in, in the long run um, you know when I left university I, I you know changed my LinkedIn to open to work and I hoped I'd suddenly get a flood of people coming into my inbox saying oh we've got a job for you well you probably would now I think I'd, I'd hope now but you know I've, I've been out for a few years but um, you know I've, I've worked on my skills in, in the last few years but a lot of kids coming out of university haven't yet and they're not sure how the landscape lies you know COVID has changed everything we don't know if there's going to be lockdowns going into next year obviously we all hope not but people are not necessarily going to invest in a career if they don't know what the landscape looks like i suppose the other question i've got is when i looked at um the 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 sort of one and a half million that are if you like registered as available for work but um but haven't got jobs and then loaded in if you like um a chunk of the economic inactive and they estimated in the i was looking at something in the guardian on, on may may july that there were something like 800,000 people described as others who were not working. So they excluded students, long-term sick, or who were not looking for a job. All right. So they were basically saying, mm. so what are these people living on? Have we accrued so much savings or something um, that people feel that, that, that they're comfortable enough not to, not to work? Or are they working in the black economy a bit? I think there's, there's a bit of both going on there. You know, big part of, uh, you know, the scariest thing about the number of young people who aren't work at the moment is that, you know, these people are between the ages of 16 and 24, and yet a lot of them are long-term unemployed. You know, that figure is around 200,000 for them. So they've been out of work for more than six months. They've lost the skills and the confidence that they had from school and university to, to interact in a workplace. Um, and, and the craziest thing is that we currently have 1.1 million jobs that are, haven't been filled yet. You know, mm. we have... Uh, in June to, to August of this year, there were 1.45 unemployed people per vacancy. Which do do we know what jobs the these are? I, I don't, and I probably should if I was going to conduct this interview, but you seem far better informed than me. Unfortunately, there wasn't a breakdown on, uh, on, on where I read about this, but um, it, it, it's a case of, you know, compared to last year when it was 4.1 people were unemployed per vacancy. But... It, you know, there are so many vacancies that just haven't been filled because there is a lack of skills. And I don't think that people don't want to get back into work, but they are cautious to, to you know, commit to a new job if, they, um, uh, if they're not sure how the landscape but, lies next year. But Sam, um, I think there are a lot of people who may want to get back into work, but are not to be prepared to commit on the terms of the pre pandemic age so they do want to work from home some are even saying and and this is anecdotal but absolutely spot on well i only want to work monday wednesday and friday or i only want to work three days a week or can you accommodate you know i have to go home and pick up my kids at four o'clock things that you probably would not have asked uh with such frequency pre-pandemic uh, it seems that the whole last 18 months has changed people's priorities about work and and i wonder if the employers are able to meet it well absolutely i mean you know some employers are sort of complaining that you know they've got young people coming along who suddenly see that they want to to go to another area of work a construction company and they're offered a higher salary elsewhere or I know it's close to their mates, close to the pub after work, so they'll jump ship. Mm, but mm. I think employers nowadays are realising that there's, there's more, especially among younger people, there's more to life than just money. And that, you know, corporate go um, you know, the corporation's goals and their values play a role. Um, and also, as you say, sort of if they can work from home some days a week. You know, if you're a barista, you, you have to be in the shop. You can't work from home. You know, it's not a, uh, you can't be on Zoom for that. But it's, it, it's part of the problem and something that employers will have to look at um and will have to think about if they want to attract people to their roles i mean finally um when you kind of look at this issue of unemployment are you are you in the camp where you feel after a settling down of furlough and as if you like the economy starts to see the impact of many of the fiscal changes that the government have made are you of the view that actually we will see it rise and become more of an issue or do you feel that because of the labor shortages uh, and the t what will be a ticking along economy if all things go well but only ticking along uh, that actually uh, we won't see big rises in unemployment i don't think we will see uh, massive rises you know growth is set to be about six percent this year one percent two percent the year mm, after mm. Um, so, you know, there won't be the sixth unemployment, um, as outlined earlier, that, that could come from a recession.
But, um, you know, the problem at the moment is salary rises contributing to inflation. And, and this is, you know, your wage is becoming less valuable. Um, but that's an entirely separate issue. But I, I don't see a wave of unemployment. I don't think we'll get to South Africa's level of unemployment of 34% that they're currently experiencing. You know, France is currently at 8%. So as a country, we're doing quite well. And I don't think that um, it, it's too much cause for concern just yet. Sam, Sam Lewis, freelance journalist and political commentator. Thanks very much for uh, joining me.